I think this episode of our podcast might be the episode that lives up closest to the name, OHL Stories, because Popper and I have always promised that where we go, we'll kind of bring you with us through the stories. And have we ever got some stories from a weekend on the road in Windsor? Maybe one of the best stories we can tell from life on the road in the Ontario Hockey League. We'll get to that. But the first thing I got to say, Popper, thanks for rocking that t-shirt. If you're not watching on our YouTube channel, there's a, a pretty nice looking t-shirt that says Farwell for Hire. It's, it's not nice looking because of the caricature on it. And that's why I'm not wearing the t-shirt. I know it's so goofy, but May Cystic Fibrosis Awareness Month, I do this fundraising campaign called Farwell for Hire. You can get swag if you want a caricature of my face and Farwell for Hire on your shirt. I, I want to raise money for cystic fibrosis research. I want us to find a cure for cystic fibrosis. I have a hard time wearing the shirt with the caricature of my face on it on our podcast. Even though I wear it all month long, I just put myself in the mindset of I'm raising money for charity. And I, anyway, I couldn't do it. I couldn't bring myself to put it on for the podcast. Thank you for doing it because I'm so weird. I was going to start off the podcast with apologizing that I didn't wear it last week because I normally wear it for the duration of the month of May during our podcast. I bought a t-shirt to obviously help your cause and your fundraising efforts, but it's a t-shirt that I only feel comfortable wearing on the podcast. I can't wear this out in public. People are like, you're wearing your co-host, you're your broadcast partner's face. Like it's a little weird if I'm wearing your face out in public, but I will rock it during this month from time to time out in public to draw some more attention to the Firewall for Hire campaign. Make sure to check it out for anybody who doesn't know about it. Check it out and donate because it's one heck of a cause and we're hitting a million bucks this year. Farwell, the number four, hire.com. I'm not sure uh, what's weirder, you wearing my face on your t-shirt or me wearing my face on my t-shirt all month long, but we'll just leave it there. And any support you want to throw our way as we try to raise $140,000 this year to get a million dollars raised overall, we'd gladly take it. Farwell, the number four hire.com. I think what I'm going to do um, maybe as a, as a birthday gift for you, as we go around the world once more, um, I'll make this very same shirt. It'll say Farwell number four hire, but it's going to be my face. And then you can wear it on the podcast. So then you're wearing my face, but it's all still far well for hire, just so we're both a little weird, you know? Sure. Absolutely. Hey, listen, I don't know that we need any more weird, but sure. let's get into, I mean, this, <laughs> this experience blew me away. So the, the Rangers Spitz series obviously opens with back-to-backs at the WFCU center last weekend. And one thing that you and I like to do is stop and pick up a coffee when we're in uh, a visiting city. Sometimes you'll do a, a coffee review from there and we'll post it on our OHL Stories YouTube page. We found this coffee shop in Windsor, in Little Italy, called Gennaro's. We liked it so much, we keep going back. I think it's four times we've been there now. But when we, <laughs> when we were there last weekend, we ran into Enzo, who is the son of the owner. And what a character, a talkative guy. And in the conversation, oh, you're from Kitchener. You must know my buddy Herbie. And it just it just went on from there. I'll let you pick up the other details. But what a, first of all, great coffee. Thank you, Gennaro's. And hello to like whatever it was that happened when we walked in that door on Saturday. I still don't know what happened. <laughs> um, and I was there. It was just an, like an electric circus, if you will. And if anybody remembers that, because that's what it was like, just people everywhere. And we walk in in suits and everybody's giving you this eye, like, what are you doing here? And you almost feel like you're somewhere you shouldn't belong. And then once you're actually in there and you get past that and you kind of look at your surroundings and you make an order, you're everyone's best friend in there. Because everybody who goes there is a regular and is there probably multiple times a day. But the part that obviously stands out is when we're talking to Enzo, the owner, and he's asking about Herbie and so on. And then I don't really know if he quite put together what we were doing there. But then his coworker came in who was going to a wedding. They were giving up some gelato at the wedding and setting up a coffee bar. And it's just like a whirlwind for both of us. We're like, well, there's so many things going on in this place. And all we want is a cup of coffee. And what we ended up getting was two shots of Crown Royal. <laughs> And that's we, not a lie. We got the coffee too, but yes, yeah, you want some shots? <laughs> and so you want some shots? 
sure. How do you say no to the owner after he, he's talking to you and asking about his buddy Herbie here in Kitchener? Herbie, thanks for listening. Um, so we had a shot at Crown Royal <laughs> with our coffee with Enzo. And I think the best part of the whole thing was as we're sitting there and the barista, if you will, the person working, making our, our turbos, um, is ringing in the turbos into the register. Enzo says, hey, Mark, don't charge for the shots. Mark goes, I never do. Like, this is a regular thing. I just go in, grab a coffee and a shot. No wonder it's so busy all the time. I'm telling you, Gennaro's. It's in Little Italy, just down from Walkerville in Windsor. It is a must if you're, if you're ever in Windsor. Fantastic coffee. Tell Enzo we sent you. A, just a great man, uh, a great coffee shop. And, I mean, we had shots. <laughs> personality to burn and yeah we're not just sharing this experience because we got a free shot of crown it was yeah. just it was great like they so welcoming they just they were so curious the yeah. conversation and then like you said a whirlwind's a great way to describe it because there was the wedding that night and one of their co-workers came in fully decked out for the wedding as she walks into the coffee shop and then heads back out to serve the gelato anyway it was something it was something and and so we really appreciated the hospitality. I, I mentioned that Enzo wasn't, I, I'm not sure if Enzo quite understood it because when we went back the next day on the way to game two Sunday, he's like, Hey, how was the wedding? Enzo, we weren't at the wedding, but he we was, in, yeah, we were and, in a and suit. he was at the wedding though. And I'm not sure what he would have remembered for like, we yeah. could have told him we were at the wedding and he might've, Oh yeah. Well, you were over a table eight. Yeah. And I'll answer the question. Everybody is asking right now, talking out loud, listening to this podcast. Yes. There was more shots Sunday. <laughs> We, we've started a tradition now. <laughs> but they even gave us a free bag of beans to That's take true. home because we said we love this coffee so much. And he first thing out of the barista's mouth, what kind of coffee machine do you have at home? I'm like, I don't know, the standard one, home hardware. And he's like, well, here, I'll give you some beans. Grind them at home. Okay. They roast just theirs really just down the street from, yeah. from the coffee shop, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really nice little operation they've got going there. I use the word operation deliberately. Yeah. And well done. Well done, Gennaro's. Very well. It was one heck of a trip to Windsor. Of course, anybody who has listened to this podcast for any period of time, I don't know if we've went more than one episode without mentioning it. Yes, we did get Antonino's while in Windsor. It, you have to. It was just as delicious as we remembered. Farzi, I'm going to tell you, we're sitting in the hotel room, each on our own bed, each with our own pies. And it gets pretty quiet because we're sitting there eating, watching TV. And I look over and Farzi's about halfway down a medium and all, all, I, all I hear is, oh, this is just so good. <laughs> I was like, yeah, this guy's enjoying a pizza. <laughs> Tell me if there was a better way to spend a game day afternoon. So this is the Sunday. So we've got Antonino's fresh. Usually when we get it, we're waiting or leaving it till after the game or we're driving with it for a little bit before we can eat it. This was like picked up fresh back to the hotel. You got a ball game on TV. You're getting set for a playoff OHL game that night. Beautiful sunshine outside. Gorgeous day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we were we were living we were living our best OHL lives on the yeah. weekend for sure. And yeah, huge huge props to Antonitos. It still is and I know there's a, we had Bill Bowler on this podcast and he admitted that he thinks Windsor Pizza generally is overrated. Yeah, I have no idea how you how you say something like that and keep a job as the general manager of the Windsor Spitfires, but you do you, Bill. You do you. I'm telling you, I have never tasted, and, and there are other, like Armando's is a good place. There's lots of good places. Uh, Jim Parker, the writer with the Windsor Star, was telling me about uh, Oven 360. He says we have to check that out when we go back this weekend. So Troy maybe Smith we says do. Franco's. Franco's from Smitty. That's right. My body says cheese wheels. I don't know. I've only also had Armando's before. So I've got a, a, a sample size of two pizza joints, but I'm telling you, Antonito's is the best pizza i have ever had in my life and i dummied that wheel i you, dummied you it yeah do you want to know how i know that all these other people that are coming out saying oh try this place and try that place they're wrong because on the antonino's box and this is the truth it's a clear white or it's a clear it's a straight white box and on like the front of the pizza the thin side there's a little sticker and it says antonino's and it says the best pizza in town if not your money back every penny that's how confident they are that they're better than all these other places other people are talking about well here's another 
example of that. So when I shared on Twitter how we had spent our afternoon and gave a little plug to Antonitos, which has happened now like six times on this podcast, but anyway, uh, two people in response to my tweet shared the story of a man in British Columbia yeah. who placed a $600 order for pizza from Antoninos. So again, I, don't take it from us two knuckleheads. Take it from the guy in BC who sent it four provinces over and spent $600 to get it. But it is a good, good pie. Okay. No, so no, no joke. Just real quick for our viewers on YouTube. You mentioned that. I got a text this morning. That's the article. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we don't make stuff up. These are OHL stories and they're all true. I just so, quickly just want to point out before we before you move on. Sorry, Mike, yeah. to interrupt. I just want to point out point out that pizza was extra good because of Manny Pava, the broadcast uh colleague of ours on the Windsor side, took us out on Saturday night. And that pizza tasted a little extra good because of all the beverages we had the night before. So I just wanted to give a quick stick tap to our friend Manny Pava for taking us out to a wonderful place called bourbon in Windsor. Yeah. And you know what? That's one of the the really nice things. We talked about this on Sunday, kind of about playoff hockey when you get to spend a little bit more time in a city because sometimes, oftentimes even, you're there for a couple of days. In this case, we got to spend the weekend there. And listen, the teams are opponents and, and rivals perhaps on the ice. Uh, off the ice, I, I there's not a single broadcast team or media crew that we don't get along with. And in some cases, like a guy like Manny, who used to cover the Owen Sound Attack, and we've known him for how many years in this business, and Steve Bell. I mean, who doesn't love Beller in the city of Windsor? The guy could run for mayor tomorrow and win in a landslide. So these are a couple of stone cold beauties. So it's it's great just to have an opportunity after a really entertaining playoff game, which we had in game one, go out, have a few pops, talk hockey with like-minded individuals, talk about the Ontario Hockey League and you know, leave that National Hockey League stuff out of it for a bit. We love the game at this level. It was great. And to finish that point, on Sunday after we crushed our Zaw and, yeah, you know, washed down the bevies from the night before, Beller and and Manny also handed me a crisp $50 bill in support of the aforementioned Farwell for Hire campaign. So huge, huge thanks and gratitude to those two guys for being a part of our fight against cystic fibrosis and helping us fund the research for that cure. One of the other things I wanted to talk about as before we get to our guest on OHL stories this week, after the great coffee shop at Gennaro's story, after the great wheel from Antonino's story, the, the WFCU center and, and the Spitfires organization, like stick tap to you all for the, for the show really that you put on before that second game on Sunday with what was going on. And I'll let Popper tell more about it because you were outside experiencing it, but also on, on the inside. And this was Saturday walking around the concourse saw that it was crime stoppers in Windsor that was doing the chuck puck And of course, if, if you don't know when it comes to crime stoppers, these are like volunteers that, that sit on boards of governance to, to run the organization. They do fundraisers to raise the money, to pay the tips. And, and these things are still being paid out. Like Crime Stoppers is a, a real driving force in helping arrest people doing illegal things in your community. Let's just be clear about that. And when you call 1-800-222-TIPS, you will be anonymous. Your name will be left out, but you provide that tip that leads to the arrest. And you could earn up to $2,000 for that tip you share. one 800 Two 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 tips, or of course here in the region of Waterloo, WaterlooCrimeStoppers.com. We are proud to have them as partners on this podcast. And check out WaterlooCrimeStoppers.com and and do your part to help solve crimes in your community. Absolutely, we love having them on board. Um, it was a great couple games we got to see down in Windsor, and it looks like it could be another long series for this underdog Ranger team. Just pointing that out, and it looks like the Hamilton Bulldogs might never have a long series. So that's your update on the OHL. <laughs> right. That's basically it, isn't it? I, I think Is that it? covers things at, at yeah. this point of, of round two, but really, and we talked about this even in the arena before the game started on Sunday, after you experienced what was going on outside. And, and, and I'm here to tell you, I, I got the chance and, and it really did stand out to me on one occasion this past season, because we had a, 
real quiet weekend in November for whatever reason with our broadcast. I think we had a game on a Friday night and that was it. Well, you're into the rhythm of the season and you want to watch some hockey. So we went down to Hamilton for a game as a family and just took in a Bulldogs front next game, gave me a chance to see Shane Wright up close and personal. And, and I just remember being struck by the experience as a fan. Now, in fairness, when we're broadcasting games, we're about as far removed from the fan experience as you can be. It's, you don't even know what it's like, what happens on the video board, because we're so involved in what we're doing on the broadcast. So I obviously can't speak to that experience in the other 19 markets, but I can tell you that that being in Hamilton, there was a lot going on that was pretty entertaining. I liked what they were doing video-wise on their scoreboard. Their Their mascot was tons of fun. They had a they had a military appreciation day. So there was a lot going on with that. And it's just a, a bunch of different things that I thought as a fan, like really enjoyed the game, went to a, went to a shootout, if I recall, and thoroughly enjoyed the experience as a fan. I think other teams need to make sure that they are looking out for that fan experience. The game should be the number one event, but there are lots of opportunities as Windsor showed us this weekend to make an event around the event of the game. Yeah, they had uh, street meat out, out front. They had uh, uh, tables set up for adults to have a beverage or kids to have a pop and a hot dog, street meat. Um, they had a bunch of those inflatable things set up so uh, kids could shoot pucks into the inflatable or like target practice. They had axe throwing out there. It's not so much of what they had. It's just that they had something. The music was blaring. There was a, a roped off area for fans to come and kind of have for lack of a better word, a controlled tailgate, right? It wasn't like there wasn't anybody out there partying hard or anything. They're just having a couple beers or a beer while their kids had some fun before the game, making it a little more fun for the kids to get involved. And <clears throat> excuse me, still getting over this. Um, but I like it because it what it does for that, like the Spitfires, for instance, it makes it easier to bring family to the game and your family. And Far too many teams around this league, the, the, the fandom of this league is in large part, I would say, near retirement or, or retired. And I think this league and the teams really need to do, do a better job of making it a more of a family affair and a reason to bring the kids and making it more entertaining for the kids if or something that they're going to remember other than just the hockey game because it's not cheap to go to a hockey game with a family anymore like you're looking at it easily a hundred bucks just to get in the door and then you're talking cotton candy and 50 50 and programs and pop and so on and so forth so if you can make it more of an event then it's a it's easier for people to get the kids out of the house for four hours right and even more so if, if teams really embrace that kind of mini tailgate there's not a lot of teams and, and leagues, if you will, that are really marketing towards that like 25 to 40 age, like my age group, where if you're going to offer where we can come and sit outside in the sun in a beautiful May day and have two or three beers outside, throw a couple axes before the game, why wouldn't I do that, right? It brings people down there and they're involved in the game and around the team and at the arena rather than going to JD's market across from the arena in London or going to strikers here in Kitchener and having a couple of beers and then going to the game, come down to the rink. This is a big thing. And especially with a team like Windsor built to win this year, first in the Western conference, over 300 goals scored. There's some excitement around the team. And if they can do more things to make it, Hey, come on out. This is a big thing. You, I think teams just need to do a really or a better job of, marketing the experience of coming to a game rather than just hey we have a good player come watch this team play i agree completely and i think every non-hockey fan too right 100 percent. every team should take note whether they're built to win this year next year or whenever yeah. make it an event around the game 100 percent uh it's funny when you talk about the family of four about 100 bucks just to get in the door for your tickets it made me think of filling up my car with gas just before we went to windsor it cost me 124 dollars to do that so take your pick tank of gas family pack of four tickets to a hockey game i know what i'm picking uh i'm not gonna let you off the hook though that easily before we okay. get to our guest first of all i'm still annoyed that you were outside and there was a, a tent with a name called street meat and you didn't bring anything inside so screw you creepo well real and quick on that i don't know what it was because on the matter. tent on the tent and i did this for our viewers 
because on the tent, it said street meat, but it was in quotations on the tent. So I don't really know if it was street meat or if it was street meat. Listen, I have been on many a corner in downtown Toronto buying whatever they have on the cart. I've had my share. You should have brought something inside because there was no media room to feed us in Windsor. So I know I had a lot of pizza, but I still have to give you a hard time for that. The other thing, though, I'm not going to let go before we get to our guest because I have it on good authority from Josh Brown, who's the reporter with the Waterloo Region Record and was with you outside. Apparently, you can really strut your stuff on the catwalk, as Wright said Fred would say. Listen, if Jeannie Becker taught me anything... It's how to own a catwalk. Jeannie Becker taught you nothing. Jeannie Becker taught me a lot, hence my wardrobe today, right? Fashion. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, there had this red carpet that you could walk as you walked into this area that they had set up. There was a red carpet for you to walk on underneath this big giant spitfire thing and it had teeth. It was really cool. It's just an inflatable. Um, but as I went to take a photo, there were these two uh, girls that were like a welcoming committee underneath this big inflatable and they kind of fake modeled like kind of like a, a Vanna white if you will right and I kind of laughed and then they were like no 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 I'm like oh no you're in this like model it up so they gave me like the big like this you know arms up in the air so I you know me I'm, I'm never been called shy so <laughs> I thought well I see a red carpet there's only one thing to do there's got to be cameras around here somewhere <clears throat> I gave him that blue steel look and I marched down. I did the twirl. I showed off the suit. How do you like me now? And then I went inside. But yeah, I had to, you see a red carpet. There's only one option, Farzi. You, you don't just walk down it. You, you own that carpet. You own that carpet. You own that carpet. Yeah. Josh it Brown says you owned it. I did. Uh, okay, all I needed, all, the only thing missing was a picture. I know I should have gotten to video and I'm surprised he didn't, but it went on <laughs> for a while. It wasn't just like a two second thing. Like if I'm going to do something, I'm going to own it, you know? All right, time to get to our um, yeah. guest on the podcast this week. And I'm just going to say this again now. You'll hear me say it again as we're wrapping up with our guest, but I did not want this one to end. I hope that you enjoy listening to it as much as I did, because we experience these things in real time when we're listening to the guests that we're having conversations with on this podcast. And boy, oh boy, did I enjoy listening to this one. Yeah, it was uh, it was awesome like top to bottom uh I, and we didn't even get to the fact that he somehow holds an ohl record in a season plus 70 Is that all? Sev 70 yeah. yes so i i meant to ask him but we didn't get to it i was like did you get scored on at all that year then <laughs> like like ever anyway um i'm not gonna get too into it i'm just gonna read his bio because it's crazy ohl defenseman of the year chl defenseman of the year world junior champion OHL champion, Memorial Cup champion, Spangler Cup champion, three teams in the NHL, two teams in Europe. He was one of the most nasty defensemen that you've ever seen with the puck. He could skate so well. He was so incredibly smart, a hockey IQ that he's now using to help younger players through a brand new podcast. We'll get to that and more from former London Knights captain and a member of the, the best team ever in the OHL and CHL and the Don Brankley Hall of Fame and a member of the Don Brankley Hall of Fame Danny Savret well Danny it occurs to me that the timing of this couldn't be any better after one for the ages between London and Kitchener in the first round of the playoffs and you and I were still exchanging emails trying to set this up and I get the sense that that you still stay pretty engaged with all things London Knights for sure yeah I mean the, the city, like you would know in, in Kitchener, uh, we really back our junior team and uh, I, I help out uh, coaching an under 16 team uh, for the London Junior Knights. So I still stay involved and, uh, and I, for the past couple of years, I've, I've coached that same age, uh, sorry, same age level. So uh, I sort of follow the, the kids throughout their OHL career, but uh, for sure, when it was a London Kitchener first round matchup, I, I tried to engage as much as I could. Now, let's just get this out of the way. I know Rick Stedman and Dylan Hunter have their spots on that bench pretty tied down, but is coaching something that you want to get into? I know you're doing financial work, but is coaching in the OHL something that, you know, interests you? You know what? It's, it's, a, it's like an addictive hobby for me. Um, <laughs> like my business is, is in, like you said, in wealth management. And, and uh, I just sort of started coaching uh, at sort of minor band. And when I was done playing just for fun, just to, you know, because I miss that locker room 
aspect, right? Uh, I, I was asked by, you know, local guys to jump on the ice and pick up hockey and stuff. I had no desire for that. So, uh, you know, coaching was sort of the next closest thing where you can have a say in, in how the team's output is a little bit based on tactics or whatever and the development of the players. So um, I was actually with the 04 age group uh, all the way up uh, 2004 birth year. And then, and then I coached a uh, minor midget uh, with Jason Williams, uh, who was uh, an OHL alumni and NHL alumni as well. Uh, we coached the the team at Elgin and then I sort of jumped ship and, and came over to London and I've just sort of been sticking at the minor midget or what they call now under 16 level. So um, with my Elgin team, we had nine guys drafted. And, and then this past year with my London team, we had seven. So uh, every night I sort of check the score sheet to see how my guys did, whether they're playing in, you know, Ottawa, North Bay, uh, Barrie, wherever. Right. So I, I try to keep as many tabs on, on the guys as possible. And obviously as they, they keep going, I'll just have to keep watching more and more score sheets. You can name drop a couple if you want to give them, you know, some pub here. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, a bunch of them are going to be up for the NHL draft. So it's probably a, a nervous time for them right now, but uh, we had, we had Hunter hate in, in Algon, who's in, who's in Barry. Uh, Bree Stonehouse in in Ottawa. We had uh, Owen Van Steetzel, who's in North Bay. Uh, we had uh, Vecchia in uh, Mississauga. Uh, and then just recently, we had a bunch of guys that were selected. Uh, Kitchener didn't have any. We actually have uh, Marcus Vandenberg. Uh, we had him as a goal as a goalie on my team and, and Elgin, who, who had a couple games with you guys. And hopefully he uh, plays a big role for you guys in the upcoming uh, years here. Let's stay with that theme on, on coaching, Danny, for from all the guys that you played for who left who had the greatest impression on you uh you know what it, um stonehouse was a was an interesting one because uh he came over from a, a chatham team that uh, wasn't a very good team but he was always up there in scoring and um he came in and i think was expecting to know just be on a better team so i'm just going to score more points right like you're you're surrounded by by more talent and um we really uh, harped on him on the defensive side of things. He, he, when he first came in, he, he sort of wanted to play a little bit like an Ovechkin where it's like attack, like I'm ready to leave the zone as quickly as possible type thing. And so the way our system was, was very uh, defense oriented. So we relied on our wingers to play a big role in the defensive zone. And, and I think early on, he maybe was frustrated and just because his output wasn't as what he expected. Um, and then I remember we were at a tournament in Toronto and I was talking to his agent and uh, he had, he had just made mention. He said like, look, he was frustrated, but I just said, listen to these two guys being myself and Jason Williams. And at the end of the day, you'll be better off because of it. And then probably, you know, 10 games in, he really grasped it. He, and then nearing the end of the year, he was arguably one of our best defensive forwards. We could put him on the ice in any situation. His out, offensive output was great. Uh, and then obviously I've seen him uh, up in Ottawa a little bit. Uh, I've watched a few games on, on TV and obviously follow, like I said, on the score sheet. But um, I think that one to, to me was sort of because you felt as though you've made a, a bit of a change in the way he played for the better and he, and he grasped it, you know? Um, but uh, all the players that we, that we did have, um, you know, it, whether it's because we had uh you know, an NHL or OHL resume, but they, they really respected us. Um, there was no real pushback. You could tell at times it's, you know, it, there's frustration because you're, you just want to go score. Well, there's more to the game than just scoring, right? Because at some point you're going to be that guy that is in the defensive zone in the high slot and, and in a good position to break up a scoring chance under a minute left. And we win the game because of it, right? It's not always about goals and assists, but uh, yeah, no, it's, it, it's been fun all the way so far. And again, I'm going to be coaching the, uh, the 07 age group for, for the London junior Knights uh, this coming season. So we should have a, a few more prospects coming through the, the pipeline, but it's uh, like I said, it's an addictive passion for me. I don't know what'll come from it. It's, it's been fun. We've won uh, both years in the Alliance that I've coached. So it's uh, it's, it's just been fun seeing the development in the players and, and, and seeing that you have, you've had an impact on them. Well, yeah, two former NHLers behind the bench. I'd hope so. Jason Williams, all all offense, you all defense. I mean, you better win. Um, <laughs> one one of those uh, when you were growing up, before you got to play with London, you were a member as a sixteen or fifteen and sixteen year old as a member of Junior B in Cambridge. What was it like playing at the Galt Gardens every night? Oh, I, I loved it. Um, 
you know, and they don't allow that anymore, right? They don't allow the underage kid to play up. So I had um, uh, my whole, I don't want to say my whole career, but halfway through my minor minor hockey career, I, I made the jump to play with the age group above me. I'm an 85 birth, so I played with the 84s. Uh, I think the first, you know, 15, 10, 15 games of making that jump was a little difficult just because the kids are a little bit bigger, stronger, more mature. Um, but then I adapted fairly well to it and it, and it was better for me as a, as a player individually, um, because I just learned to play with the older kids. And then, uh, when it was come time for, sorry, when it was their draft year, I played with them in, I think it was called a Bantam draft at the time. Um, and then the following year, like some of the guys were drafted, Shandor or Alfonso was one of them. Who's a linesman in the NHL right now, uh, was drafted by Sudbury, but, um, the, that year when, players had gone off to play in the OHL. I went off to play junior B in, in Cambridge. And I think for myself personally, development wise, that was like the greatest thing that could have happened to me. I was a, an offensive defenseman, um, could, could handle myself defensively. Like I, I wouldn't say I was a Eric Carlson type offensive defenseman. I was more, um, middle of the pack, uh, neutral type offensive versus defensive type player. And, um, it, it just playing with older players, they're, they were smarter, they're quicker, they were stronger. I had to learn how to defend players in a different way. If I'm going to get in a corner against a kid who's, you know, um, 6 3, 220, I have to play him differently than a, a player who's 5'10, 180 pounds, right? Um, so I think that really helped um, my defensive game and maturity as a player. Um, but going back to it, like that, that rink to me was so fun. Uh, the whole loop playing in, uh, I mean, Elmira Stratford, uh, even like Listwell, the, it, there's a lot of character to, to a lot of those ranks and, and it's, it was really fun uh, to play in it. And, and now uh, actually our, my minor hockey team goes and that's where we play out of when we play the Cambridge team uh, in, at the AAA loop. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a really fun uh, two years for me there. And I think it, it, uh, it really helped me uh, when I made that transition into the OHL. That's exactly what I was going to ask. I'm, I'm obviously playing against those older players, those bigger players. It, it must have, I don't want to say easy because I know how hard you worked at your craft, but certainly easier when you find, when you make, made the move to the Ontario Hockey League. Yeah. And, and for me, it was a, a difficult one. I was always a, um, a, a fairly intelligent student and the NCAA for me was never really off the table. Uh, I, I had had sort of uh whether to call it verbal commitment or whatever to, to go to Yale. And then I was selected by London and I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to go to Yale. It's not a, <laughs> it's not really a decision. Right. And then uh, obviously playing in Cambridge and then having some talks with London and then seeing the way that the London team was drafted and, and how a lot of the players were going to graduate and move on. I saw myself in a position where, you know, I maybe am not coming into a, a team in the OHL as a rookie and being slotted in that six, seven hole that maybe I can work myself up. I sort of saw an opportunity there where we're all going to be young. We're all going to get an opportunity. Like I, I, it, I sort of bet on myself. Can I be a, you know, a top D on this team? And that's what sort of made me make the decision to end up going uh, to London. But, but yeah, as you said, like it, it just, just having that, two years of playing with players that uh, were that age bracket helped me when I got into the OHL. Cause I think the biggest part for the transition of a, of a player, of a young player going into the OHL is the, that physical maturity aspect. Like um, one of, one of my players this year, Jet Lechenko was drafted by the Gulf storm in the first round. And, and I had said to them, like, don't worry so much about being on the ice all the time this summer because you can take two months off and you jump back on the ice for three to four days in a row and you're back to square one. The hardest thing is that strength component. Like it, like it takes so long to build up a foundation of strength. Uh, so it's like in the gym every day to build up that maturity. Cause you're only going to be 16 years old. And some of these guys are, you know, have signed pro contracts and are going to head off to be a professional hockey player in a year. Right. So um, yeah, it, it, uh, it, it really helped me on, on that aspect, the defensive side of it. It just, uh, made me feel, I think maybe a little bit more confident and comfortable in, in that surrounding. I appreciate the humble brag of saying that you were committed to go to Yale. Cause now I feel like I'm more of an idiot, uh, but <laughs> it's an Ivy that, league school. No big deal. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, but is that, do you think that's why you slid to the fifth round? Cause I couldn't believe that you were drafted in the fifth round of the OHL. I think, we, I think we, as a family, we were pretty honest with, with everyone. Um, I, I wanted to play in the OHL uh, the following year as a, as an underage. And at the time the ruling was you, your first two picks uh, could, could be the ones that wanted to play that could play. And, um, and we just sort of said, there's like, there's no sense in drafting me outside of that because I'm not going to come. Right. And uh, I think the, the Hunter, I knew London wanted me and the hunters traded up in the draft. Um, I think to jump ahead of Sarnia, cause I think they were, uh, there was a little gamesmanship going on there. I think they were in fear that Cicerelli was maybe going to take Dylan Hunter and just, <laughs> just out of spite type thing. <laughs> so they jumped up in the draft to get Dylan. And then, and then that sort of t- took away their London's first two picks. Right. So now you have the Corey Perry and, and, and Dylan Hunter. And those two are the only two that London could allow to play up. And as the draft kept go- like, as the draft kept going, we just kept saying, no, no, because at the time there was a team in Plymouth um, that kept drafting older players. So they still technically hadn't drafted a 2000 or sorry, a 1985 birth. So I'm like in my head, I'm like, I'm not closing the door on this. Like they could draft me in the fourth round and I would be their second underage pick that I could go and play. And, uh, and then eventually Lena was just like, Hey, we're taking you. Sorry. (laughs) Right. And, you know, so it, it was, it was, you know, at the time it was looking back, it was great to be drafted, but internally I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going like awesome that I got selected, but you know, disappointing that I'm not going to be able to play in the OHL the following year. And um, I think the hunters were, were really trying to push, uh, which I think is a, a good rule now is, is like the wild card, right? So what happens if you draft, you know, if the Kitchener Rangers draft someone in the uh, 12th round that comes into camp and he's scoring at a pace, you're like, how is this guy not allowed to play in the OHL now? Right? Like just because you were selected one and two and everyone else was underneath it, shouldn't negate them the opportunity to play if they are indeed good enough. Right. So they tried to push that through a little bit and, and uh, it, it obviously couldn't, didn't get past that quick. It got passed for the following year, but, um, but yeah, no, it, uh, it was, I was thankful. Like I look back, sometimes people are always like, do you wish you went NCAA or, or OHL? But for me, like I had a great career in the OHL. Um, I was, I was, you know, obviously a member of the Memorial cup team. I got to play for my country at, at world juniors and, uh, and then obviously went on to play in the pros, but uh, I know, I don't know if that would have been able to happen if I uh, went the NCAA route, but um, at the same time, when I was in London, I, I had went, I was taking courses at Western. So I was still going through with my education. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, there's no regrets on, on my path, but uh, I was fortunate to, to have the junior career I had. How are the marks at Western? Good. They were good. I was always a, um, a, a person who challenged myself, right? Like I, I, I rarely would have uh, a mark. I remember, I think I used to get like a history mark that would be like a 79, right? And that would just piss me off because I'm like, <laughs> it just would ruin my straight A's. Um, but I was always good in, in maths and, and science. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was fun. I took uh, economics and stats and finance, finance when I was uh, at Western and then uh, didn't really keep, keep going through once I had uh, signed a pro contract, I went off. Uh, and played uh, obviously an Edmonton system for a bit and then was bumped around, but I never uh, kept up with it. Um, I don't want to say that would be a regret, but uh, looking back, it's something I probably could have done as a professional hockey player with the amount of downtime we had. What tipped the scales for you, Danny, to go the OHL route instead of Yale? Just the opportunity of, of playing, right? Um, I, uh, I had a good uh, uh, university package with through London, but I, I think what's what did it for me was just being able to look uh, at London and see that they had had so many players that were graduating, and there was just a new crop of young players coming through, uh, all pretty much at the eighty-five birth year, uh, and I just felt as though uh, of that age group, I could be one of the top players contributing to that to that team. So. Um, yeah, we, uh, you know, it was fortunate. I was fortunate. We, we walked into, at the time, it was the John Labatt Center, which is obviously now Budweiser Gardens. Uh, the first year that the arena was downtown was my first year playing uh, junior hockey. And uh, I don't think they, they really expected much from the team. Uh, we were 
uh, a team that made it into the playoffs. We knocked off, I think, Windsor in the first round, uh, who had uh, Eric, well, you know, Kyle Wellwood, uh, who was a big force, obviously, at the junior level. And then we ran into a Plymouth team that was very mature. Um, and uh, I think we took them to seven. I'm not 100% sure. We ended up losing out to them. And then the following year, we were the same group of kids, right? With just a year's worth of experience. And, you know, we were allowed to, you know, play f- lots of minutes and, you know, make mistakes and learn from them. And, and, and as the games and months and years went on, we became, you know, three years, two years later, we became that same team of all 19 year olds. And that's the, the year that, uh, you know, sort of put the London Knights on the, on the map in 2005. But uh, yeah, no, we were allowed to, to make mistakes and we were just a young group of guys, not, expecting to do a whole hell of a lot and uh you know we sort of thrived in that role and and learned from it and then uh accelerated and and graduated to the our 05 year which was a a really special year for all of us i'm sure we'll get to 05 and we can talk about that for about three hours i think Uh, but in your first season in london uh you guys had a 19 year old defenseman who's now coaching in the ontario hockey league but is coaching for Kitchener and that would be Dennis Weidman. What was Wides like as an older guy for you, a rookie? He was good. Uh, I think, I think that's probably what makes him a good coach uh, at that level, right? Is uh, he was a mature uh, player. He played a lot of minutes uh, in, in all aspects. He wasn't uh, just relied on for offense. He played penalty kill. He matched up against uh, top, top end guys. Um, You know, I, I, him and I got along really well. Uh, You know, we, we had similar styles of play, I, I would think. Uh, he's right hand shot on left hand shot. He probably possesses uh, a lot harder shot than than I did at the time. But um, you know, it, it, he was a a good player to look up to um, because he would do things in a manner that would be positive for the team. Um, and, and I'm saying that in in he would make a big block. He would he would take a big hit, like things like that, where you're not a, a prima donna in in what you're trying to accomplish. And I think um, that sort of he, he sort of, um, paints that on the players that he, I think he's coaching here in, in kitchen. I watched a a little bit of the series uh, with London and it seems like he's had a pretty good grasp on, uh, on his defensive core and and the way that they play. When you were there in London, Danny, that's when the rivalry between London and Kitchener really was starting to build with Pete and Dale. And it's continued on ever since, obviously, what do you remember of that rivalry? I mean, the games were always intense, um, whether it's at, at our building or yours, we knew that you're going to get, uh, you know, a, a rough game, uh, you know, potentially a high scoring, potentially low scoring, but you know, it's going to be a really intense game. Um, very playoff type games, whether it's game three of the season or, or game 60 of the season. Right. Um, but a, f- a funny story on that is uh, when we uh, played world juniors, I don't know if you guys remember, but we, when we played world juniors, Pete was our assistant coach at the time, right? Mike Richards was a captain, uh, myself and Corey pair on the team from the London night team. And, um, uh, we went on to win and it was great, great year, great experience. Um, and we ended up running into you guys in the playoffs and early, I don't know what game it was. It was at home for us. So it, it, it would have been either one, two or five. So, yeah, one, two, or five. Uh, we take a penalty in our first shift, right? And I think at the time, I think we started Perry, maybe Dylan Hunter, and Brandon Pruss. And I think maybe Pruss took a penalty, and and then the Boar calls for a stick measurement on Perry. And so, and we're like, oh no, it's like, <laughs> but he at the time the 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 uh, stick measurement rule was a little bit different than it is now. I think they're a little more forgiving now, but obviously we're like, God damn it. Pete would have measured at world juniors. <laughs> right. So now, so now Corey, not only are we killing a five on three to start the game, um, but now Corey can't use his curve, right. Because they'll just keep calling it every time he steps on the ice with that stick. Right. So he had to go, I think he went to Dave Boland's curve for, for the series. Um, but yeah, no, that's just sort of what the rivalry was like. Right. It's just, uh, anything to get the upper hand and, and uh, you know, it was, uh, and that, that playoff series too was, was fun. I think there's a, a lot of video of Corey and Mike squaring off. I think it was at the end of the game, at the end of one of our games. 
Um, you know, but that, and that gets played on, you know, the NHL, like it's a, it's a big, uh, a big thing, but yeah, it's a, it's a great rivalry. It's, it was always fun to, to play in at the odd as an opposing player, uh, whether win or lose, like the, the fans were always sort of right on you and, uh, and intense. And it just made you feel like, you know, you know, this is why I'm playing the game, right. To, to be in this type of atmosphere, but yeah, I know it's a, it's a great rivalry. You mentioned Corey Perry. Um, you guys went through the OHL together. I read that your kids call him uncle Corey Perry, like a tight relationship. How was his backyard rink this year? Oh yeah. Uh, non-existent this year. Um, but the, during the pandemic, uh, I made a rink when he was playing in, uh, he would have been in Montreal and, uh, it was Dallas or Montreal, but he, uh, anyways, I, I went over, he lives only a kilometer from me and he's got a, a backyard that you could plop a, uh, outdoor rink in it. So, uh, I went over and I would flood it and shovel it whenever the snow came and we would have our kids. Uh, I have uh, three young kids and he has one, uh, of his own, who's a year older than mine, but, um, but yeah, they, they get along well. Our, our families are, are close. Um, I went to the outdoor game this year, uh, at Nashville to, to watch them and I'm due to go down. I actually went to game one of the, the Leafs game, uh, Leafs playoff series and talked to him a little bit after. And then uh, I'm heading down in, in, uh, the middle of June, um, to go visit him. Hopefully they're, they're still playing, but, uh, if not, we'll, we'll still be able to hang out, but yeah, he's a, a really good friend of mine. We, um, we shared a lot of, uh, time together. We played, you know, three years together. We had the experience of, um, winning a gold medal with the world juniors, uh, which I think for any young kid is, you know, the, the top of where you could get to is to play, you know, on TSN in front of millions of Canadians watching. Cause I, you, as a kid, you remember tuning into it. And then, um, he went off and played in Anaheim. We ended, we ended up connecting in Anaheim. I signed in Anaheim was living at his place for a little bit until I was uh, traded back to Philadelphia, but, um, you yeah, know, we've, we've become really, really good friends. Uh, we golf a lot together and, uh, we spent a lot of time together, uh, uh, off the ice, but, uh, you know, I, and he's, he's had a heck of a career, uh, right. Like he's, he's found his way to niche his way all the way through, uh, even though the game has gotten like you guys can see and witness while you're calling games, it's gotten way faster and way more skilled. Uh, he's still found a way to keep being relevant and producing and, um, being a big part of, of every team that he's been on. So uh, he's had a great career and, and hopefully he, he gets a chance to, to win another cup here. I, I was thinking of both Perry and, and Patrick Maroon, who you crossed paths with, uh, with the Phantoms, I believe, when you went with Philly's organization. Does it surprise you at all to see those guys doing what they're doing still today? Not, not really. It, Pat, it was a funny thing with a uh, funny story with Pat Maroon. Uh, I, I was with him, like you said, in, in the Flyers organization with the Phantoms, and uh, he had just come out of London, and he was a, a big body, uh, really good hands, um, not the quickest player in the world, uh, but, but to me, when, when we played for the Phantoms, I'm like, this is a great, in front of the net, low presence player on the power play, right? He, obviously, he was a serviceable player at, at regular uh, strength, but on the power play, I'm like, this guy's good. Like he's got good hands. He protects the puck. Like, and, uh, I ended up going off and, and, uh, signing with, uh, Anaheim and he called me up, I think, I don't know, 10, 10, 15 games into the year. And he's like, man, my career's done. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, they, Philly sent me home. I'm like, they sent you home. Like, like you're at home, home. He's like, yeah, I'm like in St. Louis at my house. And I'm like, so I go and look at the stats and I think he'd played at the time, maybe like six games had nine points or something and just didn't really like, I think maybe there was a clash with either management or uh, the staff at the minor league level. And maybe they just sort of, you know, had enough of whatever they were expecting out of him, and they weren't getting it out of him. So I'm like, okay. I, so I, I give a call to Anaheim and I'm like, this guy's good. Like at the time I'm in the minors. Right. I'm like, this guy is good. Like get him here. And he's at home in St. Louis, like just somehow find a way to like, he's, he's available. <laughs> just get it like, done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just he's, I'm telling you, he's a good kid. Like, I think there was a, like, he had a bad reputation for some, but like you can see his character when you watch the NHL games, like a, a, a big personality, like um, very like lovable player guys on the team really enjoy being around him. Obviously a fan favorite sort of wherever he goes, the way he plays. And, um, I remember he, he texted me one night and he's like, Hey man, I think I'm coming. 
And I'm like, good, you know, like <laughs> this is great. Right. And then, uh, and then I wake up in the morning to a phone, a phone call from Paul Holmgren, who I had saved in my phone. Cause obviously I was in Philly's organization before. And he's like, Hey Danny, uh, we just traded you for Pat Maroon. Like I just orchestrated my own trade, right? But uh, so we 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 get a laugh about that all the time. Um, and then uh, uh, he actually, I, I still remember the conversation. Um, and I hope I'm not giving too much uh, personal info away. But um, he had he had had a pretty good year out in Edmonton uh, when he played with McDavid, and I think he was looking for maybe a bigger offer at the unrestricted free agency. And I remember him just being like, man, I'm, I'm not getting like what I should get. And, and, you know, the market will just dictate what you're worth essentially. Right. Like whether there's a lot of power forwards being signed or not or whatever. And I just, I still remember I was sitting on my couch and, and he was just talking about like how there's not much out there for me. And, you know, like St. Louis is offering, but they're like way below everyone else. And I remember having the conversation with him and I was like, Hey man, you're, like imagine your 10 year old son, like going to school and then going to games, knowing that like daddy plays for the NHL team. Like, you know how cool that would be like, rewind yourself to that. And like, at the end of the day, a million dollars is a lot of money. What, you know, like, I, I know it's maybe not what he was looking for, but I'm like, you're, you can sleep in your own bed, be around your son all the time. Your son goes to school and he's like the, the legend. Cause you know, your dad plays for the St. Louis blues. And then he ended up do, signing with St. Louis, which was, which was good for him. And then they went on to win a cup in St. Louis too. Right. So he, uh, he's still, you know, he's still pretty grateful and thanks me for uh, the talks that, that we have had and, and the help that I've tried to give him throughout the years. But, um, but yeah, he's a, he's a great, uh, a great person. And uh, I'm <laughs> really happy that he's had, you know, not many people get one cup, let alone three in a row and a chance to have four. So uh, you know, he's been a, a, a good, a good buddy throughout hockey. And, uh, and he's always a, a good conversation. I can't believe you orchestrated your own trade. That's gotta be <laughs> one of the top stories we've ever heard on here. That yep. is outstanding stuff. Um, when you went to London, there were some big personalities worm. We talked about Corey Perry and your podcast partner. Now, Rob Shrimp. we have, we've had him on this podcast, but our white whale on this podcast is Dale Hunter. We want to get Dale on this podcast. I'm curious how Dale, his, how his coaching style was with such big personalities and a lot of big name players like on that 05 team. Uh, it, it'll be tough to get him on here. I think it, maybe you guys need to bring in like <laughs> someone to talk f- farming and soybeans. And I think maybe <laughs> that'll get him speaking the most he can, but um, you yeah, know, we, we, ha- we did have a, a lot of personalities. We obviously went out and traded for Rob Shrimp, who, who's uh, quite the character. You said you had him on, um, uh, you know, Corey Perry, Dil- Dylan Hunter, uh, Dave Bolin, Brandon Prust. Uh, and then on the back end, we, you know, we had Mark Mathot, Dan Girardi. Uh, we brought in Dan Fritchie, who had played a year in the NHL. Um, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but in, in our Memorial Cup year, we actually tried to get Rick Nash to come back <laughs> from the lockout year when he was in Davos. Um, but uh, just at the deadline, obviously that didn't come to you fruition, imagine, but he could have been an OA for us after I think scoring 50 goals in the NHL or <laughs> something the year before. But, um, you know, we, we policed ourselves pretty good, uh, internally. I think there was a, a pretty good, uh, respect level and leadership group. Um, and, and sort of, he, he treated us like young adults, um, less, less about, you know, being boys playing junior hockey and just more of the maturity level, um, from us. But, uh, yeah, no, he, as far as that aspect goes, he, he just sort of let us, you know, police ourselves. Um, he obviously knew that we had a lot of skill. We worked on the power play uh, quite often. Um, and, uh, and we did do a lot of attacking type uh, drills, which obviously creates offense, but conversely, if you're a defenseman, it makes you forcefully play against good players all the time in practice. So uh, I think that's, you know, myself and Mark thought, came through with the Dennis Weidman uh, grouping of young kids. And uh, I think that's one thing that allowed us to become better uh, is just being on the ice a lot. And like w- our practices were hard, are hard or we're, we're hard. And I think Dale still runs a, a very similar practice where um, he, he expects a lot of the players uh, and demands it. And there's times where there's some, you know, 
fisticuffs or fights and just internally and then guys go in the locker room and maybe they're sitting beside each other and it's over with but just that that passion and intensity that that uh sort of drives uh the bus in junior hockey i think he sort of um relies on that for a lot of it but yeah we we actually um would go on the ice uh like i said about policing it we would go on the ice in the morning sometimes uh when we were you know graduated from uh from high school and we would just go on with uh skates gloves uh, shorts and a t-shirt and there would just be obviously the the 19 year olds and, and 20 year olds would would do that but uh, we would just go on and run through sort of situations on a power play you know and and uh, like I said about policing it you know if if I walk the blue line and I kick it back here then to shrimp on the half wall then Perry maybe pops out from in front of the net to the back door or little things like that where you just keep doing them over and over and over again that when it comes time to in a game with obviously opposition and penalty killers, it's just fluent. It's not sort of like, you know, it's just an automatic, well, we've, we feel so comfortable in this situation, but, um, but yeah, I, I wish you guys good luck in trying to get Dale on. He, he does love hockey. Um, like you can go into his office any morning and he's watching whether it be uh, an NHL game or uh, a minor midget game in, in Nova Scotia or like he's they, he watches probably three or four games every morning, um, you know, while he's riding the bike. So uh, yeah, if you can catch him talking about hockey, you'd love it. But I think that your best Avenue is maybe to talk about soy, soy farm, soy meat farming or something. I'm going to start studying and I start cramming just like you did for Yale back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about that 05 roster, Danny. And, and, and like most people, when they talk about great teams, the CHL team of the century, right? You start listing off the, the Perrys and the Shrems and the Dylan Hunters and the Bolins and the Prusts and the Fritchies. But you also mentioned, you know, your name on the back end and Girardi on the back end and thought on the back end. You guys that year allowed only 125 goals over 68 games. That's banana land. Like, I don't care who you are or what team, league you're playing in. That's banana land. There must have been a great deal of pride taken in preventing goals as much as it fun as it was watching those guys score them. Yeah, I, I think I think at the time we never really looked at it. wasn't really like a target or a goal. Like now looking back, I, I'm like, geez, we, I bet you we could have allowed less, you know, like <laughs> but like if you if you were really like we want to keep it below this number. Uh, but like and Brian Rodney also was a, a great addition to us on the back. And I think in his, in our final year, he had 23 goals. We both had 23 goals a piece, I think. Um, but yeah, again, going back to be, having to defend good players in practice all the time, right. It just makes you better. We, we obviously did have, um, some help in, in net as well. We had, um, Ryan McDonald and, and Gerald Coleman. And then, um, we, during that start, that undefeated streak to start the season, I think we broke, I think it was a Brandon Wheat King's record of most games undefeated to start a season at, I think it was game 28 or 29. And we played Guelph at home. Uh, and the previous year we played Guelph in the Western conference finals. And we were the number one seed, I think in Canada at the time. And they knocked us off in game seven. And, and then in that game to extend the streak or beat the streak of, of the Brandon Wheat Kings, uh, we go to like a, a zero, zero tie against the Guelph storm. And like at the time, Guelph wasn't like a powerhouse, but they had this kid in the, in that Adam Dennis who screwed us in the playoffs and then potentially almost screwed us to break that, uh, to not break the record. So shortly after that, the hunters were like, you know what, we're going to trade for this guy <laughs> because he's, he's not going to do this to us again in the playoffs. So we brought him in, um, and he carried a, a good uh, chunk of the load, uh, uh, in, in net, but, uh, I think if you can, if you pull up the numbers, I think Gerald Coleman essentially would have been our backup. And I think he was like 33 and O or 33 and one with like a, a nine seventy save percentage and like a one something, but yeah. Um, like I said, we, we didn't take a, it wasn't like a target on our, on our board. Like we have to allow the least amount of, but like everyone was a willing combatant in blocking shots and buying into team defense. And like I said, we had, uh, some pretty good, pretty good goaltenders back there um, to stop it if things did break down. But uh, yeah, G like Jim Van Horn from London is uh, that's I think his his most favorite stat of of ever, uh, ever is with that team that, like I said, allowed one hundred and twenty some odd 
goals against or whatever. He said, there's no way anyone's going to be able to, to top that again. But, but yeah, we did take a lot of pride in, in winning and, and conversely um, we did have a lot of horsepower up front, but uh, defense was sort of uh, the first thing that, that allowed us to, to have success. So Danny, I was playing junior B in Guelph in 04. So I got to know Adam Dennis quite a bit. because I was practicing with the storm and whatnot. We've had him on this podcast. I can't believe you sent a player to North Bay to play under him, but um, I can say that because Danny and I are buddies, uh, but we had Justin Peters on recently and he talked about how competitive he was and he hated, absolutely hated when players would put pucks in the net when he wasn't looking. Now, Danny was quite a competitive goalie as well in practice. Did you ever see Adam Dennis flip out? Uh, it, it, I wouldn't have been the one that would try to, to, to spark it. I know we had, um, we'll call them shift disturbers, but we had a <laughs> few of them on our, on our team, whether it was, you know, Perry bowl and Prost shrimp shrimp really liked, to uh, to get under the skin of our own goalie. Like it's, it's in a competitive nature. Right. And it, it you know, Denny, uh, I still talk to him. Obviously he's doing a really good job in North Bay. Um, I wouldn't say as much that I gave him a player. He, he, uh, he did select uh, <laughs> Owen Van Stietzel from, from our team who obviously plays a strong game and is looking to get drafted in the NHL, hopefully this year, but a big contributor for, for them in North Bay. But uh, yeah, Denny was a, a guy that, you know, when he would get pissed off, it's almost like he played better. Uh, so a, as a, as a player in practice, it's way more fun shooting on a goalie who tries to compete like hell on every single shot and less of, you know, you, you shoot and you're like, come on, man, put it a bit of an effort. Right. So I think, um, you guys are doing a good job of asking the, the right questions, but I think you, you realize that our, our team was a, a team that just wanted to win and compete all the time. Right. And, without us knowing it as sort of naive 18, 19 year old kids, we were getting ourselves better all the time just by doing that. Right. Um, but yeah, practices were always intense and fun. And, and Denny was a big part of our, uh, big part of our team and obviously went on to, um, have a, a pro career. And then he's doing a really good job in North Bay right now. What did it mean for you to have the C on your Jersey with that team? Again, looking back, like it, I don't know if, a, if a, a letter really meant all that much. It was, um, I think it was a voted on position, which I think I take a lot of pride in, in that. And, and I sort of do the same thing with my teams that I coach in minor hockey now is I, I give the players the voice to vote, uh, you know, sort of anonymously. And, and then usually you see, okay, well, they, this kid is the one that they look to, to, to be the leader. Right. So, uh, I think I took a lot of pride in that aspect, less about having to see more that it was peer driven. Um, and I, I'm not a yeller or a screamer and just sort of logical. And when I say things it it sort of comes from the heart and it, I try to do it at the right time and, uh, and not sort of fall on deaf ears. And uh, that's sort of the way my leadership aspect would go. I compete hard all the time, whether it be penalty kill power play, even strength practice uh, in the gym it, uh, I just sort of always tried to set a good example and be very respectful. And um, yeah, I, I, I mean, looking back, obviously team, like you said, team of the century, we had a lot of accomplishments in the team uh, and then being able to, to be the captain of it was, was obviously great. But uh, like I said, it was, it was a peer voted on uh, position, which I think I take the most pride in. You talked a little bit about that streak. I think it was 31 straight games. Do you remember watching the game where the, the opposition was able to break the walls down, so to speak? <laughs> that's good. That's really good. Thank you. Um, that's really good. Uh, I do remember the game. Uh, we weren't watching it. It was actually, oh. uh, that's a really good lead in. Uh, <laughs> we were at World Juniors and uh, we were out in uh, Manitoba. I think it's like Gimli, Manitoba um, or Selkirk. Man so I think it's Z Gimli, Manitoba. And uh, Sutter was our coach who was friends with, you know, Chris Jericho from the WWF, who obviously is break the walls down his little tagline. And we had a team dinner at, uh, Chris Jericho's parents' house. And so we're all in the living room. It's a really nice cottage. Um, and we're all in the living room. And at the time, obviously no one really had cell phones. So, uh, Shea Weber is running up and down the stairs, like refreshing the landline computer of the OHL scores. And it's like, it's three, two. And like, everyone's like the whole, t every, the whole team, obviously minus Corey Perry and myself are going crazy. Right. And then, um, we ended up losing and they're like, it's final. And then the whole team sort of erupted. And it was, you know, 
our, obviously our streak had come to an end. We had uh, f- three other players away uh, at, or yeah, three other players away at uh, World Juniors, maybe four. Um, but uh, yeah, it was obviously disappointing for us to have the streak end. But that's sort of our takeaway whenever I talk to Corey about it. It's like that's the time when we sort of knew we were like the bullseye for all of the CHL, right? Um, but yeah, I know it was a, it was a fun dinner. Uh, I obviously grew up as a bit of a wrestling fan in the nineties. So we had all the Canadian wrestlers do at the time, a DVD recorded DVD on like a, the green screen. And it was just funny to hear them, like see them in their element, but wishing us the best of luck in their wrestling sort of promos that they would do. It was, it was uh, pretty funny, but yeah, that's, that's the game that we, uh, we ended up losing out to, uh, Sudbury at home. Um, we were at Chris Jericho's house. Yeah, that was a good lead in. That was clever. Okay. Hang on. So I, I confess not a wrestling fan at all, but listening to this story and understanding the magnitude of the WWF, do you ever look back Danny and say like, Holy bleep the life I've led already. (laughs) Yeah, no, it was, I mean, it was, that one was, uh, was ironic. Like we didn't know, uh, that, um, we, where we were going until we got there. Um, and it was that Sutter had played with Chris Jericho's dad, who then, as we started finding out, like, you're looking at the walls and there's like, and I'm like, why is there pictures of Chris Jericho? And then you go to find out that Chris Jericho is his son. (laughs) Um, but yeah, it it was, I mean, like I had said earlier about the pride that Canadians have in, in junior hockey. Right. And ever since you're at the youngest of ages, Christmas time, you're home from school, uh, you, you, whether it's an early morning game, cause they're over in Europe or it's a later, like you're always watching it. It's like, you know, I mean, as a Canadian, there's no other Canadian sport or team essentially that you view into more than this group of, you know, 18, 19 year old kids who are competing for, for Canada. So the, the pride of being able to play in, in that, uh, was amazing. And then obviously the irony of of it being uh at chris jericho's house and and having the wrestlers do their their shtick with their speedos and oiled up bodies and long hair uh and then us losing uh our streak that that day was uh was pretty intense but that that just to touch on the the world juniors like that training camp was was like one of the probably the most intense training camps i had ever been to like they had had us out in some small little I think it's a little probably summer resort it sort of backs on to a a lake or bay of some sort and like it was so cold and the the snow is like whistling into our our little hotel rooms and I remember I I roomed with Braden Coburn and we walked in you know walked in the hall punch our key and open the door and there was literally snow in our in our hotel because the, the backside of the hotel, the door, the doorway walks out to the lake, which obviously would be beautiful in the summer, probably, but in the winter, it's just whistling snow underneath the door. So from the outside door, all the way up till it probably like our TV was just ice. Right. But, um, but then, then we go off and play in a, a small little, um, minor hockey rink and you got, you know, some big burly, good hockey players that went on to have great NHL careers all competing to play for team Canada. And like, I think you can ask any of the, you know, TSN reporters that were there to, to watch. They were like, this is the most intense I have, I have ever seen anything in, in my life. Like there was fights of players that were, I think Dion Phaneuf and Colin Fraser got into it together. Um, and they're teammates for, for Red Deer, who's the coach of, uh, of the team is, is Sutter, but, um, but yeah, it, it was a, an intense, intense, uh, week here, buddy. Come over here. We're going to continue the show. Come with on the on. Spectator hey buddy. Here. Um, but sorry, my littlest guy just came in here. Loves hockey. Hey buddy. We were playing mini sticks a little bit before this, but Ooh. yeah, it was the, the intensity of, of that training camp was something that I like, you know, at the time you're, you're just in it and you're not even you know, sitting back and being like, I'm, I'm trying out for team. You're just sort of going through it all the time. Like, can I get it? Can I get there? Right. But um, yeah, they, you know, and that's obviously another coach who expects a lot of his players. So um, I think I had 
seen that with Dale, uh, obviously Pete DeVore was there as well. And, um, but yeah, just expecting a lot of your players at practice time. And then obviously it carried over for us at the, at team Canada in, in the training camp, but it was a, it was an intense couple, couple of weeks. I was very fortunate to, to, I guess, squeak through and make it on the team. And then, uh, to play in the tournament, essentially almost at home being in, in North Dakota was great. Okay. So that team though, like, <clears throat> excuse me, that was the Jeff glass team because, <laughs> Jeff Glass was the goalie, but I think I could have played and you still would have won gold. Bergeron, Getzlaff, Carter, Crosby, Ladd, Perry, oh, Dawes, yeah. Fanuf, Richard. Like, it's insane, that team. And you were the one that scored the game-winning goal. What was that like when you scored the game-winning goal? It was um, it was something, like, obviously, you, you, like you said, it's I, I still tell people I, I scored the game-winning goal at, at the World Junior Championship. Even though it was a 5-1 or 6-1 victory, I leave that part out of it. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, it was, it was, I think it was on the power play and I was playing the weak side, uh, my offside, and it went up to, I think it was Coburn and he let a shot go as I was driving the back post and he missed it wide. And I remember the goalie was uh, Ant Anton Kudobin and he, and he was out challenging like big time. He tried to make the save, missed the net. He was in a sort of like in a split and I have sort of recovered the puck from below the goal line and my thought was like, I can throw this behind him because like, I think Crosby was our net front guy or there's someone that has great hands in front of that. I'm like, if I just get it there, it, someone's going to bat it in. And uh, so I got to it and, and back sort of back past it as, you know, as quick as I could to that area. And it just so happened that Kudobin was, as he was recovering back to the net, it banked off him and, and went in. And uh, obviously a surprise to me because of my in initial intentions wasn't to, to make, to have that happen. And fortunately for me, it went in, my, my family was there. Obviously it was, uh, it was, a, you know, a pretty big, uh, time of my life. And I think at the time we went up two, it might've been two, nothing or two, one. And then we sort of steamrolled throughout the rest of the, uh, the game the against the Russians, but the Hey buddy, the hold on one second here. Let's Take your time. What's, what's the little one's name, Danny? This is, this is Barrett. This is Barrett. Hey Barrett. Hey Barrett. hey Barrett, who's we're your a, favorite hockey player, Barrett? We watch, we watch Corey, Perry. we watch Uncle Corey Perry last night against Toronto, right? <laughs> but yeah, he, he's, uh, yeah, he's, um, he's just sort of getting into hockey. Yeah, he's just sort of getting it, getting into hockey. Uh, so he grabs, grabs the mini stick all the time, and uh, there you go. Thank you. he's adorable. Sorry, about love that. it. Love no it. problem at all. We love um, it. It's a family, so, man. So yeah, he, uh, he. We have the little mini sticks that he loves grabbing puck and shooting it all the time. And whenever hockey's on, he's always uh, looking. My my, like I said, my younger brother is a ref in the NHL, so any game obviously has an official at it. And he's all every game. My brother is always out there, right? <laughs> Essentially, he just sees a ref and he's like, "Oh, there's there's Uncle Corey." But um, but yeah, no. Going back to the World Juniors, that was a a great time for me, obviously scoring was amazing, but just being on the team, like there's, you can go through the roster and you're like, how did Danny Savrat get there? You know? And, and uh, you know, I was fortunate. I had a, a good year, a good showing um, at training camp. Uh, I think I was a, a player that they were um, looking to add a guy who's defensively responsible, could sort of play in all situations if we had any injuries. And at the time um, Cam Barker went down to an injury uh, for us. And, um, yeah, it, it was, you know, it's, and like I said, it being in, in North Dakota, it was just across the border. So the, it was a great arena. The fan base was all Canadian and loud. And, uh, and obviously we had a team that sort of steamrolled everyone. So it was a, a really good, uh, a really good calendar year for me, I guess I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, no question. Uh, I, I want to be conscious of our time here, and I, I'm going to take it back to uh, the London days, because I'd be remiss if we didn't talk, obviously, about Don Brankley. You were just inducted into his Hall of Fame uh, during that London Kitchener series. What did what did Branks mean to you? Uh, I had said about us, like, policing ourselves in the, in the room. He, he sort of served as, um, like, the big brother to us all. Uh, he was always at the uh, arena. Um, did things a little bit differently. Like nowadays, you, you know, you, you wash your laundry and it's hanging up, uh, and the players come in and, and get into their, um, you know, stuff before they go on the ice. And, and he would have everyone throw all their stuff in the laundry and he would do it all individually. 
and fold it all. So your number, like it was, it was all, it's almost like your, your mom was doing your laundry and putting it in your stall every single day. Right. Um, and just the, the, the sort of respect that he would instill in, in players, we weren't allowed to step on the logo, uh, was sort of his rule in the, in the dressing room. We have a, obviously a carpeted locker room with the logo in the middle and, uh, no one was allowed to, to step on that. Really, um, made you sort of respect the, the crest that you wear on your chest. Um, and then him obviously having been in, in the city for a long time, uh, he really made sure that we were respectful to the community. Uh, we were out, um, you know, sort of uh, facing the community quite often as, as players. Uh, I still remember uh, after games, we would come up um, sort of the walkway from behind the, or from the locker room and, and there would be, uh, a fan, fan base, young kids, um, asking for autographs. And we would spend lots of time, you know, signing the autographs and, and then we'd go and meet our families and, uh, and then go out for dinner with our family. And at the, uh, restaurant, similar thing, someone would come out. You'd always make sure you, you gave uh, a lot of time to the, the fans that would be the ones coming to the game. Right. And, uh, I think, I think a lot of that was sort of instilled by, by him. Unfortunately, he, um, he had passed away, but his honor is obviously being kept throughout uh, London and especially with the London Knights. And it was an honor to, to be inducted uh, into his Hall of Fame. And I, and I think any player that had gone through uh, playing for him would, would, would say the same thing. Like he, he would treat us all like his, whether it be his own sons or younger brothers, like he was uh, a great influence on a group of young, you know, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old kids coming in. Uh, moving away from home uh, and and sort of calling London home. And um, he made it fun to be in the locker room. So, you, you know, we, we wanted to be in the locker room. Like, you, you know, we would come in early and leave very late. There would be times where, you know, you'd come home to your billet family and they're like, we already had dinner. And you're like, oh, sorry, we were just playing in the locker room. Like, you know, I mean, just just being kids, having a good time in the room. But it was uh, it was a, all in all, it was a great experience. I, I uh, loved having him. Uh, around us, um, you know, in a, in a hockey setting and even an off ice setting and, uh, obviously, a, a sorely missed, uh, individual, but, um, luckily for, for me, I was nominated to be in his hall of fame and his legacy is, is continuing in London, especially with the Knights. Just seeing your son there made me think it's going to be funny when he gets a little older and he goes over to uncle Corey Perry's house and he sees that trophy case and he gets to realize what this guy has won because he's won everything. But you talked about that 05 year for yourself, OHL defenseman of the year, CHL defenseman of the year, world junior gold, OHL championship, Memorial cup. And the Memorial cup would be the final thing you won that year. And for me, if I had won all of that and after a Memorial cup win, I would want to run down the streets of London and all my hockey equipment. <laughs> Where are you getting this info from? <laughs> Where are you getting this from? The, okay, so sources. This is good. Jeez, you're digging and that's good. So we, um, after we won, uh, obviously we come into the, we take our pictures and everything. We come into the, the locker room and um, the London night locker room, I think at the time was, was big. And I, I looking back, I think the other teams have a lot bigger locker rooms now. <laughs> um, but there was so many people down there like there was season ticket holders like <laughs> aunts uncle everywhere like it like i was in my stall or in my area of the stall and it was just like shoulder to shoulder like you're at a club like in my full gear right and um so obviously we we have a couple of drinks and my parents are there and it's it's fun and and my dad was like you know you you promised them you know I, after the game i always used to go kitty corner to the rink there's a spot on the corner called jd's market grill and I would always have, it's all windowed and I'd always have a, a seat there in my family. I was uh, fortunate to have a lot of support in, in uh, my parents, grandparents, great um, aunts and uncles, and uh, they all had season tickets. So after every game, whether it be home and away, Dale would always call them the coaches crew because wherever we would go on the road, they'd always talk to Dale after the game, you know, like while we're waiting for the bus. And um, so we would always go there for, for dinner after every home game. And my dad's like, you said you would go if you won that you would go there so i end up obviously i couldn't get unchained get undressed because there's nowhere to like that's so why i just booted off my skates tossed on my shoes and i literally ran over um you know with with a beer and it was packed in there and 
and I did like a little hot lap and make sure I talked to the owners and sort of showed my face. Like I said, I was, I was going to, they actually swapped out my beer, gave me a different one. And they kept that, you know, half crushed can that I was running with <laughs> on, on display there for the longest time. Um, but yeah, I ended up running through and it was funny because the, it was, it happened sort of so fast, right? Like think about it. You, you celebrate in the dressing room afterwards for, I don't know. I probably was in there for maybe 15, 15, 20 minutes. And then I'm doing like a hot lap at a restaurant with my full gear on like an idiot <laughs> soaking wet, just probably reeking. And people were like, I remember there were some people that didn't like think I was the real person. They're just like, Oh, this, look at this guy dressed up like, a, a big like an actual hockey player. <laughs> And then eventually, like, by the time I got made my half circle and I started headed back to the door, those people that didn't really, they started coming and getting pictures. So I, it was, uh, yeah, it was a, a quite a, I totally forgot about that. That's good digging. That's good journalism there. But yeah, and it was, uh, again, you're, you're young, you're having a, a ton of fun. And, um, you know, I, it was a, a spot that I would always go to after, after games. And I was just sort of holding up my, my bargain of the bet that I had said would happen if, if we did win it. That is fantastic. Just fantastic. I want this to last forever. I just want I you to know that it's been so much fun. I always let Pope have the last question. So before he gets to that, uh, because we are coming up on time and you've got a family and you've been generous with your time here tonight, but the first NHL game, Danny, we haven't even touched on that. What was that like for you? First NHL game for me was, um, was, was quick and sort of unexpected. Uh, uh, I was drafted by Edmonton and at the time they, uh, they had brought in um, Pronger and, and went on a big, well, at the time they did go on a big cup run, but uh, they had a very um, veteran defense core. And uh, I ended up, there was a, 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 comp- a couple of injuries to the D in the same road trip where they ended up having to call up a, a D man from the minors. So I was one of the, the D men that was fortunate enough to go up. So I ended up getting called up. Um, you know, like I said, it, it happens. So you, you land and go to the rink and grab something to eat and put your gear on. And um, it, it happened so fast that it, it wasn't, it wasn't really like something that I could uh, absorb in other than the fact that I remember being there like during the anthem. And I'm like, Holy cow, I'm playing in the NHL. Right. <laughs> um but, uh, but yeah, and, and a similar situation sort of happened to me when I was in, in Philly with, um, the flyers for my outdoor game. And, uh, it was after Christmas, they had had an injury and they had called me up and the outdoor game, the winter classic is always played January 1st. And so my parents are like, should we come or not? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to play like, I don't. and anyways, they end up coming. We went out for dinner the night before, which was great. Uh, and then the, in the game, uh, I ended up scoring. That was my first NHL goal. So my first NHL goal happened to be at, at, uh, at Fenway park. It was like, a uh, you know, a, a shot from the pitcher's mound to third base that, that went in. Um, but yeah, and I was fortunate. My, my parents were right there behind the, the third base dugout. So, uh, it was, a again, like a lot of things happened in my career that uh, my parents and, uh, and supporters were, were able to be there for. So I was very fortunate in that. My last question was going to be about Fenway Park, because I think playing hockey at Fenway Park would be just unreal. Be unreal. But yeah. <clears throat> I do have another one. Um, Dave Sr., your father, he actually played for uh, the St. Catharines Blackhawks with Rick Aduno, who we had on last week. So that was a tough time to play hockey, to say the least. Would you think it was tougher for him to go and play hockey at that time? Or was it tougher for him policing Dave Jr., yourself and Corey? Uh, we, yeah, we, I would say playing. Uh, he's got a pretty good gash on his nose. I think he's, his nose is a little crooked. So I've never really asked how it all happened. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I, I do know that the game was, was uh, a lot more physical and, and ruthless at that time. Um, my, my brothers and I uh, have a, a pretty good gap in, in, our, uh, in our ages. So uh, my actually my youngest one, uh, Corey, he would have been sort of more of the wild man that uh, would be the the pit bull in starting fights. But um, just to, without you asking the, the question that playing outdoor as a kid is great. You know, I think everyone in Canada grows up, you know, skating on a pond. And and then I remember the, the morning skate or practice, sorry, the day before you're like, wow, this is so cool. You're like outside in the NHL playing like Chris Pronger's on the team, Mike Richards on the, like, you're like, where am I? Right. So it was, uh, 
it was a, a great uh, experience. Uh, it was a loud atmosphere. It was snowing a little bit. Um, but yeah, I was fortunate enough to, to score uh, my first goal. And um, actually the, the NHL photographer, um, well, the photographer of the NHL who does a lot of the, the Stanley Cup playoffs and big events is from London. He's a buddy of mine, Dave Sanford. And so he actually was the one that was taking uh, shots of me after the game, holding the puck up uh, you know, in front of the, the green monster. But uh, yeah, it was a, a great experience. It was a, I'm very fortunate to have the, the junior and, and pro career that I've had and um, have moved on obviously into the financial world and, and still sort of stick my nose and in, into hockey and try to help out uh, where I can and uh, pass on my knowledge and, and development. So it's, uh, it was uh, guys, it's been fun talking. You guys have done a, obviously an excellent job in, in your research and, and question asking, asking, this was a lot of fun for me. Real quick. I, we mentioned that you were doing a podcast with Shrempy now pump your podcast a little bit. Yeah. We, uh, Frank Cervelli sort of, uh, approached us. He was my uh, beat writer in, in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, I think he, he knows I have some hockey knowledge that I can share. And, uh, and obviously with, with Rob Shrimp. Uh, like you said, he's a bit of a character and the same, he's uh, a knowledgeable, knowledgeable guy. So we, we just, uh, we run a podcast. We've only done one so far. We do it every week. Uh, it's, uh, I think we air them Wednesdays. It's called the, the shrimp and, and Sivret show. It's nothing uh, real catchy other than our, our names are in it. Um, you guys might not like it. A lot of the, the color scheme is a lot of green, yellow, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, white and black, but, uh, but no, we, we talk all things hockey uh, through development and uh, we, we break down clips and, and try to give a little bit of a behind the scenes aspect uh, a bit more on like a higher level hockey IQ level than, than some of the other uh, shows that's more so focus on off the ice antics and things like that. So we, we try to really make it into a, a teaching element. I coach a team uh, with the, the Knights here at, at under 16. I do development in the, in the summer for fun. And Rob does uh, the same from, from Latvia. And uh, we have a lot of passion in that. So we're just sort of uh, trying to give back as much as we can on, in the development and hockey ice IQ type of thing. Green, gold, blue, red. Who says we can't get along when we're just talking hockey, eh? Right. Come on. Green jacket, gold jacket. <laughs> Tons of fun, Danny. Thanks a million for doing this. Awesome. Thanks very much, guys. Good luck in the playoffs with the Rangers.